Hi, I'm Keith Miller, Technical Services Specialist with Keystone Retaining Walls. Today's Tech Talk is our third installment with today's question, how tall can you build a gravity wall and when do you need geogrid reinforcement? Well, that's going to depend on block type, your wall height, your soil conditions, and your loading conditions. Please enjoy our Tech Talk. A gravity wall relies solely on its own self-weight and block setback to resist the soil loads behind the wall. When the self-weight of the block is exceeded by the soil load, the block weight needs to increase or the soil must be reinforced, creating a soil reinforced gravity wall. How tall is too tall? Let's try to answer that. First thing we want to determine is how much soil we need to retain with our retaining wall. Design height is based on top of leveling pad to top of cap unit. Yes, that includes the embedment depth. To determine your proper embedment depth, please see our Tech Talk number two regarding embedment depth. Once we determine the design height of the retaining wall, we want to determine what type of loading condition the wall is going to see. Is it a level grade or no surcharge situation? Does it have some type of slope behind the retaining wall? Or is there some type of surcharge? such as a live load from a vehicle traffic or a sidewalk, or a dead load from a building, such as a shed or a garage. Once we determine the height of our retaining wall and the loads that it has to resist, we can pick a block height uh, for that specific application. There's a variety of different blocks out on the market, and those blocks can vary in height from four to eight inches and depth from six to 21 inches deep. Four inch blocks are typically going to be landscape application products. Eight inch high is going to be your taller gravity walls and more structural applications. Same with your depth. Your six inch depth blocks are going to be more landscape planter bed type things. Uh, 12 inch is pretty much a standard depth for your structural products. And there are some 21 inch deep products also available. Weight is also an important factor in, in our design of our retaining wall. So we want to know what the weight of the block is. We want to know what the setback of the block is, and we want to know how it's connected together. Is it a lip or a lug or a pin type system? Block properties are specific to each and individual block that's going to be used in the retaining wall. So we want to know what block is being used for a proper design. Once we determine the block that we're going to use, we want to determine what setback we're going to use. If we're doing a gravity wall, we strongly encourage people to use the one inch setback compared to doing a ver near vertical configuration. With the one inch setback or a setback in the block, the block is actually falling back into the soil it's trying to retain, thus giving it more strength uh, in retaining that soil behind the retaining wall. Once we determine uh, how tall a wall is gonna be, the loading condition in the block that we're gonna use, we wanna determine what type of soil we have on the site. Do we have a sand or a gravel material or a silty clay? By determining the soil type behind the wall, we can determine what kind of load the soil is going to impart onto the retaining wall. Better structural soils like a sand or a gravel, we assign a friction angle or a fee angle to the soil. Typically for a sand and gravel, that's going to be 34 degrees or higher. For a silty sand, it could be 28 to 32 degrees or sand, silt, lean clay, that friction angle be 26 degrees or less. What these numbers represent is how much force uh, the soil is going to impart onto the back of the retaining wall. Gravity walls rely on the block facing weight and a batter to resist the overturning forces. Based on our soil friction angle, there's a wedge of soil that's going to develop and try to slide down this failure surface to push the wall over. Depending on what this friction angle is, say this is your sand and gravel, uh, determines how much load the block has to resist. If we have a silt or a clay type material back here, our load is going to be higher because that has less of a friction angle. So based on the load of the soil and the load above the wall will determine what block facing we can use. So we look at the weight of the block and the setback of the block to determine is it able to resist the forces that are trying to overturn it. If we do that all successfully, 
we have a successful gravity wall. There are gravity wall charts available for all the block types uh, that are available on the market and give you good direction on what block to choose for a specific application. A couple examples here is our Keystone Compact Unit. It's an eight inch high, 12 inch deep product. Let's look at a level condition with the sand and gravel. Our height is 3.67 feet, top of leveling pad to top of cap. And if we have a clay type soil, we're gonna have a three foot maximum height uh, for a level condition. If we take our Keystone Standard Unit, which is an eight inch high, 21 inch deep unit, a bigger, heavier unit, you can see how the size of the block really affects how much you can do as a gravity wall. In a sand and gravel condition with a level backfill, we can do about seven feet in height. Silt and lean clay, about five feet in height. So you can see how the block size and the soil type really affect how high you can go as a gravity wall. Once we exceed what we can do with a gravity wall, we're gonna do a reinforced wall. When we get into a reinforced wall, we're going to use products that are six to eight inches tall, 10 inches at a minimum depth, uh, typically 12 inches deep. We're not going to use any type of landscaping product uh, for a reinforced wall. The reinforced wall consists of a polyester geogrid and the block facing. The polyester geogrid is a high strength material specifically designed for reinforcing soil. It can be a knitted product such as this one here, or a woven product. They are both coated with a PVC coating for UV protection and stability of the grid geometry. They're typically uniaxial, meaning they have strength in one direction. So we wanna make sure we put the grid in, in the proper orientation uh, behind the retaining wall. So if we have our wall facing here, we wanna have the strength direction of the geogrid perpendicular to the face of the wall. Typically that is rolling the grid out and cutting the grid in length. There are some biaxial geogrids on the market, uh, biaxial meaning strength in both directions. So make sure you know what type of grid you will have purchased uh, in the proper orientation when you put it in the retaining wall. You also might find in some situations, depending on your wall height, you have different strength grids uh, in different elevations of the wall. So with strong, taller walls might have stronger grids at the bottom of the wall and lighter strength grids at the top of the wall. When we design our uh, reinforced retaining wall, we're gonna look at two things, external stability and internal stability. External stability meaning we're gonna build a mass of soil that's big enough to resist the soil loads and the loads above the wall from sliding the wall forward or overturning the wall. Typically, that distance is gonna be 70% the wall height. So let's say I have a 10 foot high wall and my grid lengths are gonna be 70% or seven feet at a minimum. If I have a slope at the top of the wall, that number might be larger, or if I have some type of surcharge here, that number might also be larger. That's typically what we find is that the mass of soil to resist the soil pushing behind it is 70% the wall height. Once we determine how big the, the mass of soil is for external stability, we look at the internal stability of the wall. So depending on what the reinforced soil type is behind the retaining wall, directly behind the retaining wall, we choose a grid that's strong enough to intercept the failure plane of this soil and long enough to go past it to keep it, the soil from sliding forward and pulling the grids out uh, in, to stabilize the internal part of our retaining wall. Typically, we'll have the first layer of geogrid, two blocks from the base of the wall and two blocks from the top of the wall with a maximum spacing in between of two feet. This helps and prevents us from having connection issues with our block facing. Like I stated before, each block has its own specific uh, characteristics, and part of that is also connection. This is what you would typically find in the design of a reinforced retaining wall. Grid length, 70% the wall height, maximum grid spacing of two feet. Do all that, we make a mass of soil that's reinforced with geogrid reinforcement that's big enough and strong enough to resist the forces from behind the wall and on top of the wall. 
There are gravity wall charts or reinforced retaining wall charts available for various block facings. These are here to help you out determine uh, how long the grids will be based on a soil type and a loading condition. As the height of the wall goes up, the grids get longer. As the loads increase, the grids get longer also, and you might have more layers. So take a look at that. Thank you for your time today. If you have any questions, please give us a call or visit our website.